This is Andrew Hall. You're listening to Dead Hand Radio. My guest for this episode is Jonathan Edwards, retired veteran and UAP eyewitness. I'm also joined by Jeremy McGowan with an update on his own experiences with these phenomena and a few teasers about his work with Skyhub and a new project he has in the works. In this episode, Jonathan shares two sightings he had just days apart and less than a week ago. He goes into detail about his thoughts on the sightings and what steps he took to help his mind come to grips with what he had witnessed. We also talk about Jonathan's military service and how that may have helped him process this experience. Then we get into the topic of UFO disclosure and how the culture of the military may be changing to be more accepting of these types of experiences among members of the military community. All this and more on the UFO edition. Thanks for listening. All right, well, uh, welcome to Dead Hand Radio, Jonathan and Jeremy. Jeremy's uh, returning guest, uh, a returning guest of the podcast. And uh, Jonathan is a first time guest. And from what Jeremy has told me, I don't know anything about Jonathan, but Jonathan has an interesting story or an interesting experience that he'd like to share. And I'm excited about um, hearing more about this. Um, Before I get started, uh, Jonathan, would you like to give us a little bit of info about you and your background? Sure. Uh, I'll give you a little bit. Uh, I was in the military for about 14 years, um, went in, enlisted, and eventually became an officer. And uh, originally first started out as an infantry officer and then a military intelligence officer, where I was trained as an all source intelligence officer, a signals intelligence officer, electronic warfare as well as a, an SSO, which is uh, someone who handles clearances and various other things dealing with highly classified information. Okay. What years of service were you in? I was in from 1995 through 2009. Can you talk about where uh, you were stationed in the military? Sure. My first uh, outside of basic training, which I had at Fort Jackson, um, South Carolina. My first duty assignment was Fort Eustis, Virginia in, in Newport, Newport News. And uh, I was there until probably 1999. And then I went to Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was there for a couple of years doing all kinds of training and schools and so on and so forth. Then I went from there to um, uh, Fort, no, from there to Fort Huachuca. Uh, Arizona, and uh, went, that's where military intelligence school was. Then Korea for a year, a little over a year, and then back to Fort Huachuca for the uh, military intelligence advanced course, and uh, from there to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for the 101st Airborne. And then I went to Iraq after that, and then you know back to Fort Campbell. So, Jonathan, how, how what uh, what year were you in Korea? I was in Korea. 2002 to 2003. What part of Korea was that? Was that um, Seoul? Yeah, I was stationed in Yongsan. Hmm. Uh, Jeremy, did you have any more questions about his uh, service? No, his I, time in service. I just, I just wanted to tell you and tell the listeners that I've known Jonathan for, oh God, twenty something years. Yeah, at least twenty three, twenty four years. Twenty three, twenty four years. Um, yeah, I, actually. Probably a little bit more than that. Um, yeah, I think you're right. John, Jonathan and I went to college together. Yeah. And uh, I I would like to say that I decided, but it probably wasn't exactly the case. I think college decided that I wasn't exactly right for college. <laughs> and uh, college sent me into the military. Uh, Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan ended up sticking around on campus for a while longer. Uh, Jonathan ended up going into the military right after I finished my first tour. So yep. he was enlisting as I was separating the first time I ended up yep. going back into the military uh, uh, while, while Jonathan was in. So we've, we've, we've known each other for <laughs> a, a couple decades now. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. 
What was your area of study in college, Jonathan? Oh, um, I had two majors. I was a um, history major and a government major with the uh, uh, sociology, psychology, and philosophy minors. So I, I came out with two, two bachelor's degrees. Interesting. So history, what uh, part of history is most interesting to you? Honestly, I, I like... Um, I like Asian studies. That was where my, my concentration was, as well as uh, I love, love military history. I always have since I was a kid. So those are really my two things. I don't know a lot about you or about your experiences. So I'm going to kind of let you lead the next segment and just take me into the, uh, the time and the place as much as you can tell me and uh, share your experience with us. Okay. Um, well, I believe it's just this last weekend, uh, Saturday, I believe. Sometimes days kind of go for me, so just bear with me, you know. Um, but, yeah, I believe it was Saturday evening, about 5.30-ish. Uh, I was out on my deck with my dog and uh, my wife, and we were – I was looking at the moon because it was a beautiful, beautiful full moon. I was going to take some pictures of it had my camera out there and my other camera as well, my, my 35 millimeter camera. And, um, you know, I was up there taking pictures and I caught some movement out of the corner of my eye. It was twinkling. Like I thought it was a star maybe at first. Um, but it was in a place in the sky that I really didn't remember seeing a star in the back of my brain. It was saying, wait a second, that's not right. Um, and then I thought I looked over at it and I thought maybe it was a satellite or, uh, a low low earth orbit satellite you know or maybe uh an airplane flying high you know something like that but it was moving very fast and there was no lights on it whatsoever except for just one gigantic white shining bright light and it was very bright um then you know i realized it was really moving very fast and uh i also noticed there was no contrail from it and there was no noise so that kind of, you know, sends off the bells in my brain. Um, told, told my wife, I said, hey, take a look at that. What do you, what do you, you see it? And she did. She looked exactly, you know, she saw what I was looking at. And uh, then it started to blink. And I said, all right, well, it's blinking. You know, again, goes back to my brain of maybe it's a star twinkling. But, you know, I, I know at this point it's not. But your brain is sitting there trying to rationalize what it's seeing because it's not there was no point of reference for what I was looking at. My wife was doing the same thing. Then it, when it blinked, all of a sudden it appeared somewhere else in the sky in a split second. And I mean like a split second, it, it was, I, I, I can't even give you a reference point, but across the horizon almost. And then it would blink and move somewhere else. And this pattern continued for 10, 12 minutes. It was all over the sky. And, uh, you know, then it stopped and uh, it went from the eastern side of the sky to the western side of the sky uh, in just one blink, completely opposite side of the sky, and it hovered. And as it was, well, it appeared to be hovering. Who knows what it was doing, but it appeared to be hovering. And um, then these two white orbs just kind of shot out of it. And they were blinking, blinking as well. And uh, they kind of, from my perspective of where I was, it looked like it was like a V formation is kind of what it looked like, for lack of a better way of explaining it. Um, and then they blinked a couple times and then they shot straight up into the sky. But before they did, the, uh, the original, the main one, shot straight up into the sky. And uh, then the other two did the same thing and shot straight up and then, then were gone. And I stayed out there for a few more minutes and watched and nothing else happened. But they came from the east. And over to the east, there's a lot of critical infrastructure in my area. Um, there's a nuclear reactor uh, over on the Hudson, Hudson River, Indian Point nuclear reactor. There's Camp Smith. There's West Point Military Academy. There's Stewart Air Base. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff. Uh, and, of course, New York City is not too far down the river, so on and so forth. Um, but it came from the direction of Indian Point nu nuclear reactor, which in my brain was, was you know, pretty interesting. I, I was in the military for a long time. I, I, I know military aircraft. I know civilian aircraft. I know more or less what they're capable of um, pretty well, actually. 
And, you know, I, I grew up looking at planes because I lived in the tri-state area. So there's airports everywhere. So you see them all the time. Tri-state area being New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Uh, so, you know, I, I saw planes all the time. This was nothing I've ever seen before. There's nothing I've ever experienced before. Um, it was, it was something. Did you draw any conclusions as to what it might be? Honestly, I didn't want to draw any conclusions at first. If that makes any sense. No, I totally get that. Um, I've never had an experience like that. Uh, Jeremy has had an experience and he can probably relate to it uh, more from a, an emotional and a firsthand perspective than I can. But what did you feel when you saw this thing? My wife tells me constantly that I don't express uh, emotion very much. Um, don't show emotion, excitement, a lot of things. I'm a pretty even keel guy, um, temper wise, as well as just in general, you know, emotion wise. Um, and I guess that would be kind of what it was this time too. I really didn't show too much emotion and inside. I was sitting there thinking to myself, what am I looking at? You know, um, what is this? My rational brain is saying, okay, well, it's probably X, Y, and Z. My military mind is wargaming a thousand things it could be and, you know, where it's coming from, what it's doing, why is it here, so on and so forth. Um, you know, mainly, you know, it's something terrestrial. It could be our, us, us testing something. You know, that's what was in the forefront of my brain. It's probably us. We're probably testing something. I'm probably seeing something I'm really not supposed to see. But, you know, okay, got it. That's the way it is. Um, what am I going to do with it? Nothing. Who would listen to me? Who would believe me? That, that's what's going through my mind. You know, and then, of course, my brain is saying, okay, critical infrastructure. We're near, we're near the things I just talked about. Um, and, okay, then I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, why was it coming from that direction? What was it doing there? What was it doing when it stopped? What was it doing when it was hovering? You know, what was it doing when it was moving from place to place, either hypersonically or, or I don't know. I, I, I don't have words for what it was doing. I just don't. Well, you don't have words for why it was doing it. You can certainly describe well, what too. it was doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, like I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I'm a pretty level headed guy. Um, been around for a while, done a lot of things. But even people who have witnessed something that they don't understand, it's, it usually leaves them feeling confused. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with it. It left me a little confused for a little bit there. I, I'd like to know what I saw. I, you know, I've, there's a lot of questions I have I would love answers to, which I'm sure I'll never get. <laughs> and I'm, I'm good with that. You know, I, I, I'm good with that. But like I said, you know, almost 14 years in the military and doing a lot of classified stuff. I, I get it. I do. And I'm, I'm fine. But yeah, that was something. I mean, I've seen some weird stuff in my time in the military and outside the military. And, you know, but and I'm used to a lot of things, but that was outside my comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. That's understandable. I, I saw Starlink the other night and uh, we went out to Area 51 just to see if we could see anything. Didn't see anything spectacular except the moonrise. That was incredible. It was gorgeous, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 That, it was uh, two nights ago. It wasn't a full moon, but seeing Not the moon quite, yeah. come over that ridge, man, it was incredible. But Starlink going straight overhead i mean it was at 12 o'clock have you ever seen it starlink yeah mm -hmm. it's that is the first time i saw it and it blew my mind because the sky was completely well other than the stars you know the stars out there you could see every oh yeah the southwest it's, it's god's country out there yeah uh you can see the edge of the milky way man <laughs> it just blows you, you can. Away. yeah yeah and uh, here comes starlink so at first i was like what is that you know and then I realized, okay, I know what that is. I had never seen it before. I'd only heard of it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you don't realize that you can see it. There's a lot of things you can see with your naked eye, especially on a clear night. And, and out in the Southwest, I mean, like, it's God's country. I mean, the skies are clear. They're big, you know, and they're bright. Even on almost a moonless night, the stars still illuminate everything out there. So, yeah, you're a lucky man living out there. Oh, I love it out here. The, the landscape out here, the desert landscape is just gorgeous. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to move back to Arizona, man. I, I loved, loved Arizona. Is that where you grew up? 
No, I, but I was stationed out there for a couple of years, you know, down the border, down by Tombstone. That's where Fort Huachuca is. So loved it. Lo- loved it out there. So, Andrew, I'm, I know your listeners are very used to you having a, a Cold War podcast and, and digging into history and things. And with your permission, I'd like to I'd like to do something that I've not done before because it's not been within my wheelhouse or my experience to do it. And that's bring a little bit of the woo woo into this, if you don't mind, because there is there is something attached to Jonathan's experience that that kind of crossed a border and uh, and affected me over on this side. And I don't have a very good understanding or a, a very good idea of it. I mean, the first sighting or the second sighting? The, the, the first one. The first one. Right. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, so, so time out. There was a, was the, the sighting you just shared with me, was that the first sighting or the Yeah, second? that was the first sighting. Okay. So you had a subsequent sighting after that? Yes. But let Jeremy tell his, his, oh, version, wow. his thing first. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so Jeremy, you have a tie in with, with Jonathan, Jonathan's experience. Yeah. And I, I've intentionally kept you in the dark here, Andrew, because I love your reactions and the way that you have your mental pauses. And I, I've had one sanity check put on this already and I'm using your show and, and your audience as kind of a secondary sanity check to all this. Um, as you know, and as many of your listeners know, I am a very pragmatic, very nuts and bolts. If I can't smell it, taste it, touch it, see it, it doesn't exist type of guy. Exactly. Um, and recently with my, with my evolving friendship with Sean Cahill uh, and with Lou Elizondo, I am I am in the process of opening a little bit more of acceptance into the fact that this phenomena, it requires humanity. It requires us. And there is a direct correlation to consciousness or quantum entanglement or something that is bearing on, on the phenomenon, its observance, its presence, our ability to observe it. Jonathan came to me with his first sighting in detail, probably I'd say what, 10 minutes after it happened. If that, yeah, if that, I mean, I called you immediately. Yeah. I mean, he, he picked up the phone. He's like, man, I gotta, I gotta tell you this. I took copious notes. I, I wrote down absolutely everything that Jonathan said. Um, I had him write down everything that he was telling me. And then I waited about an hour And I called him back and I asked him similar questions a second time to see if the answers were the same or if they changed, uh, you know, an hour after his event and everything was on par. And like I said, I wrote this down in detailed format. Like I was back in the military taking a, 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 a police report. I got no place to go with it, but I I took it for posterity, right? So the next day, I'm, well, the next evening, I should say, I'm outside with my daughter. She's skateboarding in the neighbor's cul-de-sac, and it's cold, and I'm wanting to go in. And I'm telling my daughter it's it's time to go inside. Uh, And I turn around, and I walk back towards my house, and I could hear my daughter kind of following me on the skateboard, and she started crossing the street. And, you know, as a concerned parent, obviously, I turn around to watch her cross the street. And right then, man, I look up. (laughs) This, This is the second time in my life I have seen something that I could not explain. I saw basically what Jonathan saw without the same behavior pattern, I saw an intense glow at a low altitude over top of the neighbor's house. Uh, And it only lasted about six or seven seconds. And it was basically my interpretation. My feeling of this was like the phenomenon was saying, I know what you did. I know that you wrote it down. Here's me. Screw you. You're going out. I'm out of here. And it was, 
it was like Loki, man. It was, it was messing with me. It was pushing my buttons because I literally tried to pull my phone out of my pocket. And you know how on an iPhone you've got, if it's on the lock screen, you've got the two buttons down at the bottom. It's the flashlight or the telephone. I've had an iPhone since the first iteration came out back in 2009. I know everything about this phone. For the first time in my life, I kept hitting the damn flashlight portion instead of the camera portion, and I couldn't get the phone turned on in time. So, and like I said, it was gone in like six seconds. But like Jonathan picked up the phone and called me to tell me his experience, I picked up the phone and called Sean. And Sean is my resident woo. And Sean is like, man, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt that you didn't see that because, and I, I was telling Sean, I was like, it, it's like, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that, that Jonathan saw, except it didn't separate and it didn't disappear. It just, it would blink and move and appear somewhere else. Then it would, it, he goes, man, I don't doubt that it wasn't the exact same one that Jonathan saw. Cause it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. It, it knows it, it's, it's linked to the conscious aspect it you were in a state of you were you were in an emotional state at that point where you wrote those memos and when things were going on in your life that that it decided to choose that moment in time to reveal itself to you and most likely jonathan was going through a similar thing and you guys you guys saw the same damn thing so whether or not that's that's what occurred i have no idea but I had my sighting in 1995 in Jordan and I had this one on, you know, just a couple days ago and it's leading me. It's, it's continuing reinforcing my journey to coming to the conclusion where I say that there is a definitive correlation between human consciousness, mental disassociation and, the revealing of this phenomenon to individuals. I definitely agree with that statement. Yeah. Here's my mental pause right here. Um, because I'm, I'm processing what you said and I don't doubt that the two incidents are connected. I'm starting to see that there is, there is a correlation of the woo to this phenomenon, but there, there is a, there is a, a prevailing theory uh, or a competing theory out there that the phenomenon is us, uh, that this is not aliens, this is not nuts and bolts, but it is a physical manifestation of a type of global consciousness, and meaning that the phenomenon is us, we are it in nonlinear time, in in another dimension that you know. What I saw could have been me. Uh, it, it could as well as easily been, uh, you know, somebody that I was pulling out of a trench in World War I. It could have been somebody that, that pulled me out of a trench in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it could have been a family member that was coming by to, to say hi. It could have been the Hitler inside of me that was just messing with me. Or it could have been... Uh, you know, one of the angels that, that resides in all of us, that was, that was just coming in to, to make sure that everything was cool. Because as Sean says, there's, there's a Hitler and there's a Jesus in each one of us. And it's up to us to choose which one to let out at which time it, it's still elusive. It's still way down in that tunnel, but I'm starting to see that there is a definitive correlation between mental states of observers and what is being observed. I'll tell you straight up that uh, the 12 hours before I saw that uh, right after Jonathan saw his, my world just about collapsed on me. And, you know, it was while I'm sitting there watching my daughter skateboard in that cul-de-sac, I'm pretending to watch my daughter skateboard in the cul-de-sac, but I'm not really there. I am somewhere totally different. You know, I'm, I'm there in my body. My mind is, is not inhabiting my skull. So maybe, maybe Sean is absolutely right that when we learn to disassociate, 
and maybe the CE five guys saying that, you know, they, they go through the meditative states and change, change their vibrational uh, existence. It, it sounds, well, for lack of a better word, it sounds like absolute horse crap, but the end result is the same. I was not inside of me watching my daughter skateboard. I was somewhere completely different trying to figure out how to save my world. And, and that's when, that's when I see what I saw. Well, I'd like to throw it back over to Jonathan and ask when you had your first sighting, were you going through any kind of similar emotional period in your life? Uh, something akin to what Jeremy was just describing? Definitely was. I'd rather not talk about what it was, but but uh, yeah, I, I was definitely having a lot going on. There's no question. Thank you for answering that. And uh, because that does lend uh, a little bit more credence to what he was saying. And that's a, a theory that I've heard previously, um, Jeremy. So yeah, that is a, a very interesting uh, idea and a different perspective than what is typically presented publicly about this whole phenomenon. It is so much easier for me. And I, I don't want to speak for your audience members. I don't want to speak for you or Jonathan, but it is so much easier for me to look up in the sky, uh, imagine seeing something that I cannot explain and attributing it to being a civilization 20,000 light years away that has developed interstellar travel than to think that that is a manifestation caused by a conscious disassociation between mind and body, but yet it is still physical in nature and can have uh, physical effects on our reality. I, I can believe in the nuts and bolts, you know, little green men a whole lot easier than I can believe in, in the conscious aspect of this but I am, I'm really starting, I'm starting to be able to accept the notion of a, a type of conscious entanglement between the presentation of the phenomenon and, and the person. There certainly is something quantum about it. Uh, or actually, I can't say certainly. I mean, in my mind, there appears to be something that acts quantum about it uh, because it affects everybody in a different way. You know, it appears to, to everybody in different ways and it leads to conclusions that, you know, if these are species from other worlds or other dimensions, that there's multiple of them showing up. Until proven otherwise, it's as valid as anything else. Okay, that's a that's a good yeah. way to put it. Valid, yes, it's valid. Exactly. And there's there's so many. After the conversations that I've had with Sean, I've kind of adopted. If I'm, if I'm going to accept an idea, the idea that I believe that I will accept unless another one comes by that's better, is that. What is happening? This this phenomenon. You know, there may be grays, there may be reptilians, there may be spider creatures, who the hell knows, but they're all us. The physical representation is the only difference because it's the consciousness aspect of this that we are all the same thing. That there, yeah, we're all linked. We are all linked. It's all the law of one, it all goes back to a single a single thing, a single being that somehow was fractured into potentially billions upon trillions of different individual conscious states that have all been manifested inside of different, different bodies. Um, and that this, this, this universe that we're in is designed to both keep us apart but at the same time, give us a way to come back to that single, single state in that it's, it's our journey through this that determines is, is our path back to being coalesced a long one and a hard one, or is, is it 
Is it a short one? And how do we get there? So I'm going to back off of that for a little bit because that's a, a little outside my area of study. You and Sean certainly have had some interesting conversations I haven't been privy to. You've um, explained a little bit about that right now, which is fascinating. And I'd, I'd like to dig into that deeper with you. Mm. Um, but I would like to give Jonathan an opportunity to jump in here and both uh, tell us about the second experience and um, add any more to the conversation that, that you feel would be pertinent. Sure. All right. Well, the, the second sighting happened uh, two nights later. So Monday, Sunday was an overcast, cloudy night. Couldn't really see anything. It's very, very overcast. Um, so the Monday, um, I, believe, I believe it was Monday. Anyway, whatever. Uh, it was a beautiful night out on our clear night. Uh, nothing in the sky. It was just a gorgeous night. So I went outside. Um, right about 5 30 was about the same time it happened the first night the interesting thing about this though is i was sitting in the living room with my wife and all of a sudden i just got up and said i'm going outside um she's well what are you doing and i was grabbing my slippers and that's why i'm going outside and i just grabbed my phone walked outside dog followed me um walked out and just looked up right in the exact same spot in the sky the other night didn't even realize i was doing it second i did that I mean, the second I did that, I saw something. It was just immediate. It wasn't as bright. It was a little dimmer, um, but the activity was the same. Uh, but it wasn't as, I don't know. Uh, it didn't go as far across the horizon as it did the night before, but it was still definitely, you know, jumping around, for lack of a better term. Um so, you know, I'm, I'm watching this and I, and I tell my wife, I'm like, it's back. I yell to her from out on the deck because she was just inside. I say, come on out, it's back. So she came outside. And then uh, we noticed that most of the activity was centered in the area of where Mars is. That just happened to be the part of the sky of, of where the activity was. Um, still, it, it was like, it was almost a full moon. It wasn't quite a full moon, but it was like, you know, just beyond and whatever i can't remember the terms are regardless um there it is it's doing its thing it's it's bopping around and um i'm it was moving just as fast and everything else and i'm thinking to myself maybe it's higher up maybe that's why it's a little dimmer maybe i can't see as much my brain's doing the same thing that it was the other day it was wargaming everything i'm seeing it's coming up with a thousand possibilities and a thousand options for those possibilities and so on and so forth you know and uh and then it just stopped. It, it just stopped completely. And the light went out and then it was, it was just dark. And, uh, there was like, a um, we watched for my wife and I watched for a second and nothing happened. So she walked back in the house and the dog stayed out there with me and I continued to watch and I'm glad I did. Um, I saw for a split second, and the only thing I can describe it to you as is a shimmer in the night sky. I, I can't describe it to you. It wasn't bright. It was just a shimmer. You know, something that shouldn't be there. It was just, I don't know. And uh, then, out of the corner of my eye, I, I see movement coming from a bunch of different directions. Um, turned out to be five objects. No lights, just completely dark. Five objects just appeared out of nowhere and shot right at the shimmer and disappeared. And the only way I I, I can describe that to you is because you know it's a yeah, it's relatively well lit night, but still it's dark out, you know, and it's high up. Um, these things appeared to be, um, I don't know. Jeez, uh, I can't even think of the words. Darker. They were darker than the night sky. It was just a. It was a dark spot in a dark spot. You know, does that make sense? Yes. So that's the best way I can describe it to you. And they, they shot right up from the, all these different directions, right to where the shimmer was. And then that was it. It was over. And I still sat there feeling the same way. You know, my, my rational brain, my civilian brain, you know, is saying one thing and my military brain is doing something completely different. My, my wife is 
excited and everything else. This is, you know, two nights in a row. And, and she's telling me that I'm not getting excited uh, or anything like that. And I, I tried to explain to her um, that, you know, and every military person who's listening to this show or every law enforcement um, person will understand this. A lot of people will. When you're in the military and then you're not, or law enforcement and you're not, you have two, two minds. So you have your military mind and you have your civilian mind. And when you're off duty, the military mind is still going, but you're in off duty mode. Well, when you become a civilian, you realize that it's just two separate people. Bottom line. So I'm sitting there trying to war game in my brain, trying to figure out what it is that I saw and everything else. And again, you know, I, I thought of a thousand things it could be. And the same, same things go through my brain. And it's, you know, uh, something that we have, or something that our country has. It could have been that too, that, you know, hell, it, it, we, we weren't aware. It was just in our, our AO, you know, or our airspace or, or whatever. So that's what I was thinking. But so that's, that's what we saw. And then my wife and I went back inside. And first thing I did was call Jeremy when I was outside and it was happening. And I said, you know, texted him, called him. He didn't pick up because he was doing something. He had uh, family things going on, I believe. And, um, you know, so I texted him, it's back, you know, and he got back to me almost immediately. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's, but there it is. So that was interesting. It was, that was my second sighting. First of all, the, the shimmer that you saw, was there any shape to it or? I, the best I can tell you, it, it was kind of an amorphous shape. So it's changing shapes as you're looking at it. Just kind yeah, of... I mean, it, yeah, maybe it was kind of an oval, maybe, uh, but it was not a, obviously. It was no, by no means a perfect oval. It was just kind of a shimmer that looked like an anomalous blob, like an amoeba, for lack of a better expression or term. Sorry, you know, just amoeba shape, I guess, and it just kind of shimmered, and you know, that was it. There was a little shine to the shimmer, but not much. It was just a, a real quick boom. That was it. The, the only thing that I can associate that shimmer and the, the, the shape that you described reminds me of the experience of one of the scientists that I, that I read out at Skinwalker Ranch. Um, and when he saw a portal open up in front of him and there, there were several descriptions of it because it happened at several different times, but in one, at one point it opened up and the person witnessing it was able to see what looked like another world on the other side of the portal. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that's I, wild. I got to recommend I wish that I could book. tell you I saw another world. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and then the other time that it happened, there was, it, it opened up, it looked like a, mm, the color of a sunset sky. Oh, wow. So in the middle of the sky where he was standing, this That's sunset amazing. colored thing opened up and then some creature crawled out of it. Wow. So it sounds That's, pretty far out there, but. It does, but you know what? It's no more far out there than, than anything else that's out there really. I mean, it's just an un, un, un understood or unexplained phenomena at this point. We just don't have a point of reference to, to go there. The, this, uh, this shimmer that you saw and the shape of it kind of ascribes itself to a, a portal. And then these, these five craft as, as you, uh, called it possibly craft or, or yeah, whatever uh, I were. called them craft uh, objects, craft, you know, God knows, were they, were they drones or something for that, for the, for the ship? I don't know. Were they other smaller ships? They, they went into it and then the shimmer disappeared. It's exactly what I saw. When I saw the shimmer, my brain <laughs> was going, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of the seventies, eighties and nineties. I was born in 1970. So my brain goes to Star Trek. My brain goes to Star Trek and thinks, ah, it's a Klingon cloaking device. <laughs> you know, and then my, my rational brain kicks in and my, my military brain kicks in. And I say, I think to myself, okay, well, okay. It could have been some kind of, you know, light discharge in the upper atmosphere. It could have been ice crystals, 
around the moon that just happened to be drifting that way. And there was a reflection. You know, again, my brain is, is doing what any, I would believe any normal person's brain would do, try to explain. But my brain was thinking cloaking device. Yeah, we have working active camouflage. So having, having a nuts and bolts type of technology that exists outside of our control, it's not far off to assume that they would also have something like active camouflage, but a portal makes sense. Active camouflage makes sense. Um, an optical illusion also makes sense. Hell, you could have had central serous retinopathy at the time, and that would make sense. Hey, you know, I, I just turned 50, so I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm there with you in two months, brother. Fascinating experience uh, that you had. Now, now, did you write down the second experience? I did. In detail, okay. Yeah, and I sent that to Jeremy as well. Yeah, al okay. almost, almost exactly what happened the first time. Uh, on my side, happened the second time. Within minutes of both sightings, Jonathan picks up the phone, tells me what's happening, texts me what's happening, writes up a uh, an observation report, and gets that to me. And I maintain both of them here because. You know, the sad state of affairs is here in the United States, we don't have a central authority or any authority, for that matter, for civilians to submit these reports to. There, there is a scientist that I spoke with. Uh, her name is Linda Zimmerman. She lives in your area. She's written several books about the Hudson Valley. and But she's a scientist. She looks at this from the, the scientific method. She's talked with experiencers for, for decades. I'm going to put you in contact with her if you would like to. And she might, she might have some questions that I haven't come up with, but I think she could help you at least unpack a little bit of what you experienced. Yeah, please definitely put her in contact with me. I'll give you my details. And I'd like to say something else too. I mean, when this second one occurred, I also, um, I contacted my brother, let, let him know. He's, he's uh, still in the military. He's in the Air Force. I'm not going to tell you anything else about him, but he, he has done a, a lot of the, the things that I've done. So we have very similar backgrounds, a lot of things. Um, but he's got a level head and, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely, he'll give it the, okay, you sound like an idiot. Don't even bother, you know, don't go any farther. But he didn't. Um, he listened to the whole thing and he, and he told me flat out, he said, honestly, he said, from what I know, um, yeah, that, that sounds very lucid and, and very logical. Um, and it makes an awful lot of sense. I, I'm, I'm the everyday guy you see on the street. You wouldn't look twice at me. I'm, I'm just a normal guy. And, you know, I wouldn't think twice about, you know, sitting there, and looking up at the sky, I just happened to do it at the right time, at the right place, and had my experience. And uh, yeah, like I said, you know, he 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 gave it the scratch and sniff test and said, you know, that sounds right. And from things that he's heard from people, um, yeah. And you know, I really appreciate his his input on uh, on the whole thing. I really, it really, it really did. So just want to put that out there. That does bring up a question um, about the culture within the military. Do you think because of his response, I know he's just one person out of the entire military, but do you think that the culture of the military, because of the events and the, uh, the conversation that's been happening over the last couple of years, do you think that culture about what UFOs are and the fact that people are seeing them is starting to shift yeah, I think so. I, I do. I, I hope it continues to do so in a positive way. Um, I think there's a lot of us out there have seen things. In fact, I know there are. Um, and what we are told, uh, don't talk about it. We're, we're, drop it. No, don't go forward with it. Do not make a report. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, whether it's, it's because higher ups are scared or whether they're, they're told the same thing. You know, who knows? Um, again, that's above my pay grade. But I do think things are changing. I think a lot of people um, are seeing things. I, I know, uh, and I don't want to go into details, but I saw things when I was in Iraq um, that I, to this day, cannot explain. 
similar to what happened with Jeremy. That's all I'm going to say about it. Um, and I know that there are a lot of other people who have had similar experiences because um, people talk, you know, uh, in whispers and behind closed doors, but we still talk. And I think over time, um, the more people like Jeremy or myself come out and, and say things that we've seen, I, I think that will open the door. My, my, my hope is that it will open the door for more people to do exactly the same thing, because I believe that's the only way that this is going to come to light and to the forefront. And I, I believe truly that it is something that then needs, um, needs to happen. It, it needs to come to light in the civilian world as well, uh, because that's the only way I think it's going to change. Are there good and bad sides to it? Absolutely. But um, are there things probably the public should not be aware of? When I was younger, I would have said, oh, no, absolutely not. The public needs to know everything, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but as I've gotten older and, and had my military career and had access to things, I would say, no, the public does not need to know everything because there are things that would put them at risk um, and cause mass panic. So uh, is that true? Yes, it, it absolutely 100% is true. Uh, I, I firmly believe that, but I still believe that this policies need to change. They need to become more open. Um, the government needs to share with us more, I'm not saying everything, but I believe that if they had a second pair of eyes, so to speak, you know, helping them, it might make what seems to be an insurmountable task uh, easier. That speaks to the efforts of Skyhub and what they're trying to do and developing technology. Yeah, I didn't know anything about that until just recently. Jeremy was sharing that with me. And it sounds, it sounds very, uh, very interesting. It's something I definitely want to learn more about. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was having a, a conversation uh, about an hour before I had this conversation and uh, on a project that I'm working on right now. But I... I love the idea of Skyhub and the 30 second elevator pitch for Skyhub is that it is probably the world's most ambitious uh, open source science project geared towards allowing the common person to contribute to the process of disclosure. Um, it, it is a technological box that you can build yourself that contains a variety of sensors that measures a variety of different things uh, from from uh, video to telemetry data to all sorts of stuff that you can put together and, and put out in your backyard or on the top of your house or in a remote area and when it captures an event uh, the event is sent to the cloud and machine learning and AI algorithms are applied to it to filter out uh, moths and 747s and uh, shooting stars and things that people commonly get uh, uh, confused by. And it then spits out the fact that uh, once all the unknown or once all the knowns are accounted for and filtered out of the system, it, it gives you a list of the unknowns, the unidentifiables. And then the, uh, the data is released to the scientific communities and academia for people to pour over and study and, and be able to look at and see if they can come to a determination. So Skyhub doesn't tell you what it is. Uh, it tells you what it isn't. Uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But going, going back to what Jonathan... I'm sorry, can I, can I just interrupt yeah, real quick? Yeah, yeah. That just reminded me of something I did forget to say about the first setting. At least I, I don't think I said. When I saw the object flying... I also saw an airplane um, passenger jet or, or something like that flying at approximately, well, I don't know, I'll call it 35,000 feet for, for whatever. Um, it, was, it was up high and you could see the lights and you could see the, the form of the airplane. You could definitely see the contrail and you could absolutely hear it. But the object was magnitudes higher than that was. So I just want to, that remind, Jeremy saying that reminded me of just... Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that Skyhub is going to be doing is it's going to be able to uh, produce triangulations. It's going to be able to produce uh, positional fixes uh, and, and be able to tell you the altitude of objects uh, in, in the second or third iteration of, of the Skyhub. Um, but we cannot depend on government to provide us disclosure. The, on, the onus is on us. 
the onus is on the civilian world to go out and capture the data and find the information because even if the government has knowledge of what's there we don't have the mechanism in place in the government to be able to provide for that outlet like i was saying That's before right. well jeremy you, you used to be the man you used to be on the inside loop as did i when people say you're part of the system you're the man that was us you know we absolutely were in that loop absolutely part of the system and i'm telling you as somebody who was definitely inside a lot of things there's you know a need for disclosure there's definitely a need for the for the government and the military to release a lot of those records well we don't know how to re- we don't know how to do it the the military is so fragmented yeah the process inside the government and inside the military is so fragmented let's say that you're the guy that has in his hand a zero point energy module that was given to us by uh, whomever from Zeta Reticuli, right? Yeah. We've got proof right here. Who does that guy ask permission from? To yeah, and I don't think they know. They don't. The, the, the mechanism is not in place to be able to- I mean, I saw data. firsthand when I was in the military. I mean, things are definitely run. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> You're not, you know, part of the system where it, it's, it's, it's that fragmented, but, you know, in, in the military and the government, continues to run every day it will continue to run tomorrow and so on and so forth even with all its issues and all its problems but you're right it it is fragmented and i don't think that people know who to go to get things released and i think they want a lot of people higher up want to release things but they don't know how it's it seems like this humongous insurmountable task and i can tell you firsthand uh, when i was doing things uh for the military (laughs) you know there was so much paperwork, you know, for a paperless army, there was so much paperwork, it was insurmountable. And, you know, even, and then then you get into dig- the digital world and, and there was so much digital stuff going on. It does, it seems like, well, okay, I have to fill out form A to get to form B and then form B goes to form 27 alpha. And by the time you fill everything out, you forgot what you were doing. And who, did, who you're supposed to talk to, and you probably forgot your own name and your main line in coffee. So there you go. This, this is why I think that projects like Skyhub are so important because we're never going to get it given to us. We, we, we can get it, but we got to go get it. We got to create Yeah, I think you have to have a finished product to be able to go walk into Congress with, well, it, with that finished product. If, product. If a pilot of an F A eighteen snaps a photograph, it's going to be classified as become a part of this information campaign, or it's just going to it's going to it's going to find the bottom of a suitcase in, in a warehouse, and it'll never be released. But if I go out with my technology and I find it, I am not under those same restrictions. I and and you and and Andrew and anybody else who goes out there and puts together a sky hub or any type of informational gathering device they can contribute themselves to disclosure and and hasten this process faster than we can ever get it from this government or any government the term that we're using to describe information coming from uh, about these sightings the, the, the information that we have about these sightings, I think the majority of people already accept that these things are real. I think the disclosure, the term disclosure is an antiquated term. And I, I think we need to throw it out and start using the term co- confirmation. I'll buy that. Yeah. I disagree because I think that we are living inside of, of our own echo chamber. And the people that we talk to on a daily basis primarily are the people that are thinking the same way or feeling the same way that we are. Because for, for example, Andrew, you don't, you don't, you don't bring onto your show a religious leader who completely disagrees with the idea of extraterrestrial existences. So the folks that we're talking to are the folks that are already of this mindset, but the guy across the street, uh, two doors down, the the professor of biology or whomever else, the, whom the people that don't have these experiences are are not in this world. These are the people that 
that the the consensus is that they might have the panic episode when disclosure actually happens. Um, you know, it's it's there's seven billion people, eight billion people on this planet. I think we're a long, long way off from being able to say that the majority of people accept it. The more information that comes out of the government, the more confirmation we're going to have. I don't think that it's it's um, something that people are waiting on. I think like people like Skyhub and the people that are developing their own Skyhubs are going out there and collecting the evidence for themselves to find out not not if these things exist, but what are these? What things? are they? Yeah, and and that's how I'm approaching it. I I don't believe that we're ever going to get hundred percent confirmation from our government, uh, especially if our government has known for a very long time, because can you imagine the civil liability or the human liability? If the government has had this technology, had access to this technology, let's say it could have saved my grandfather from cancer. Let's say it could have protected the Amazonian rainforest from 75% depletion. Let's say it could have provided uh, free energy and changed the scope of world economies, but they chose to use it for a weapon system or keep it secret or not, not apply it. There is a liability on a global scale to humanity, and somebody's going to answer for that. And I don't think that they're going to come out and tell us this. And I don't even think that the process is going to come from the government or any government. I think the onus is on people like you and me to go out there and find this for ourselves and build our own scientific database that withstands scrutiny and prove it. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I, I believe that it's going to come from, from exactly that. I don't believe the government will, as much as they may want to, and I do believe there's a lot of people out there who do, but like we were just discussing, they don't know how. And then there is that issue of, you know, civil li- civil liability, a- as well as people freaking out and just losing their ever-loving minds. And, you know, no, nobody wants that. That doesn't serve a, a purpose to anybody. So the, the more evidence that is developed, uh, collected, cataloged, scrutinized, and presented through the the private sector to the public. And the more that the awareness is elevated by that process, the easier it is for the government to then chime in and show us what they've got. Yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's why it has to start with everybody. Everybody yeah. has to do their their little part of going out there and documenting, collecting evidence, talking to other experiencers, other witnesses, and just getting the word out that this is really happening. It's something we don't understand, but through a collected effort or a collective effort, we may be able to come up with some answers. We may find what this thing is and why and why it's doing what it's doing. Well, and let me put it out there too, that um, I'm sure you've heard the term 90-10. I know Jeremy has. He and I have batted it back and forth between each other quite a bit. Uh, 90%, it's us. 10% or maybe 5% is is unexplained. Um, Maybe the other 5% of that is so highly classified that nobody even knows about it. So we'll, we'll put that there. But, you know, Again, it, it still goes back to we have a right to know. And we, we really, I think as, as the general public, a worldwide global public, we have a right to know. Are they all good? Probably not. They're probably just like, like us. Maybe, and maybe you know, the government would, would say, well, that's why we don't tell you things. You know, it's for your own good. We don't want to panic you. Um, you know? So you, know, you want to go down that rabbit hole, that's fine. But the bottom line is, is that we do, as, as, as a people, we have a right to know what's going on. And I think it affects every single person on this planet. Um, so, you know, starting with the grassroots efforts of, of Skyhub, I think is an absolutely amazing thing. And I, I, I think it's, it's going to be the seed that hopefully, you know, grows the tree of knowledge, so to speak, that, you know, 
enables enables us to get the the results that we all want i think but yeah the, that grassroots effort has to start with each person you know each person like you said it is our right to know but it yeah. is also our responsibility if we want to know to go out there and find the answers for ourselves and that means in a responsible way i believe in a responsible way absolutely yeah there's a lot of nut jobs out there man so you know you you, you, you got maybe i can can i can i say that Oh no, no, that's totally okay. Fine. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot that, of whack jobs fine. out there. There, <laughs> there are people out there who do some unscrupulous, yeah, unethical and, and things. That, that serves no nobody, you know. You know, I I, I on record as, as saying one thing also. Um, UFO Twitter is what's that? So UFO Twitter is basically what is it? Wow, it, it's multiple things, but basically, people on Twitter chime in to the conversation about ufos yeah oh, okay it's it's a five-headed dragon is what it is um <laughs> it, it it serves a purpose of good and trying to push forward disclosure but there's ob there's a lot of a, a lot of strife and and aggravation that uh, you could walk away with if you spend too much time looking at it Gotcha. There, there's a there's a thing on UFO Twitter that I want to address because I have been accused of it myself, and I want to set the record straight. Um, there are folks who have a severe distaste for anybody that monetizes the information surrounding UAPs, um, and I would like to speak directly to the 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 entirety of UFO Twitter and let you know that I got a mortgage. I've got an electric bill. I still take showers with hot running water. And all of that takes money to do it. I paid for my own Skyhub. I am building my own Skyhub out of my own money, from my own income, from my own job. But if there is a way that I can end up with slightly more funds today than I did yesterday by monetizing a portion or all of a story of an event or a sighting or uh, a manifestation or anything, I am going to do that because I can then use those funds to continue my quest in seeking the truth. What I do not like and what I agree with that UFO Twitter has a distaste for is people that sell access to salvation. And I think that is an absolute horrible horrible thing to do by saying that if if i learn how to do ce5 i will pass on that knowledge and i will teach people how to do it um and i'm not going to sell access to your future self or i'm not going to sell access to certain types of 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 behavior and i think the people that do that are reprehensible uh, there's no reason you can't sell the rights to a story or put it on Spotify or, or gain access to funds because you sold advertisements through your YouTube channel telling a story. But to sell access to somebody's inner self, I, I think that is reprehensible. No, yeah, this is absolutely 100% my, my personal philosophy. If the idea of consciousness and the correlation between the phenomena is correct, I think you should under, I think people should understand that those who give information and ask nothing in return are probably the ones that are helping to advance the process. But if they're, if they're demanding your followership, if they're demanding you sell your possessions. If they're demanding your loyalty, walk away. I hear you, man. So let's find a good way to wrap this up. And then, um, but yeah, I would like to leave it open to, especially if, if the experiences and the sightings continue, because we're talking, this happened last Tuesday, like five days ago. Today's Saturday when we're recording this, and I'll try to get this out as soon as possible. Jeremy, I, I want to get an update from you on Skyhub and um, other adventures that you've been on recently, but uh, we'll do that next time. And for um, for anybody that wants to reach out to you, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, so uh, on Twitter, 
is is very easy to get in contact with me. Look for uh, uh, at Jeremy Unidenti one. So that's uh, unidentified, but it's not the whole word with the uh, the number one on it. Or just search for my name. Even easier. I have a Skyhub email account. Uh, it's Jeremy at Skyhub.org. And you can feel free to write to me on that. Um, as far as what I'm doing now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser. Uh, I am working with a, a director and a producer, and we are vetting out the potentials of a, uh, either a mini series or a, uh, a, a full length feature on me, the use of the sky hub and some very specific hot spots in the Western portion of the United States. Awesome, man. So keep cool. An, cool. Keep an eye that, on that. That uh, that'll be That sounds awesome. It's it's in progress. We're still in the vetting stages. Uh we've we've gotten some some pretty good names attached to this already. Uh a couple of the other guys uh that are uh that are involved in this. I I don't have their permission yet to say their names, but uh but uh but follow me on Twitter and uh and keep apprised of that one cuz that that could be huge. Uh Jonathan, what about you? Do you have any public um profiles that people can reach out to no, you, connect with you not really i'm not really a public profile kind of guy if somebody wants to get a hold of jonathan get a hold of me outstanding good deal all right gentlemen we'll leave the door open to continue the conversation at a future date i had a real great time being on here with you andrew really did it was a it was a good time well thank you for coming on thank you for sharing your experience and thank you for your service thank you very much i, I appreciate that all right take care as always, man, it's been a pleasure.